you have your Bibles with you this morning, I would invite you to turn to 1 Samuel chapter 3. 1 Samuel chapter 3. It is the time of the judges where each man does what is right in his own eyes. The twelve tribes of Israel are still getting into their land. They're still dealing with individuals that they hadn't pushed out of the area yet as God had told them to do. The judges, names that you may remember from Sunday school or previous lessons, Gideon, Barak, Deborah, Samson. So far, we've had the introduction of this young boy. His backstory being the son of a barren woman who prayed to God and made the promise that if God would bless her with a child, he, she would give that child back to God. And as quickly as he was weaned, she did indeed leave Samuel with Eli in the service of the Lord at the tabernacle in Shiloh. In this last, we got to compare and contrast between two godless men, two sons of wickedness that just happened to be the priests. So here you had these two men, Hophni and Phinehas, who were supposed to be serving the Lord, supposed to be serving Israel as spiritual leaders who were in fact using their position to abuse both God and man. At the end of that time, at the end of chapter 2, there was a prophet sent to Eli, the high priest, the father of Hophni and Phinehas. And this man of God spoke a curse, a prediction from God that Hophni and Phinehas would be killed on the same day that no one in Eli's family would grow to be an old man. They would die in their prime. And that they were being disbarred from serving as they had in the past. And in fact, they would beg the priests for something to do. Because they had so horridly violated God's laws. So... We're in this time of confusion. We're in this time of self-interest. We're in this time of denying God. Wait a minute. Are we talking about the judges or are we talking about America? Uh, and see, that's why I like to come back to these stories because the further we think we are from them, the more, the more we reflect them. It's in this time where God begins to move so that the people of Israel will be returned to Himself. We pick that up this morning in this third chapter. We're going to look at both the third and fourth chapters this morning. Read with me if you will. I have the NIV, so your wording might be different. The boy Samuel ministered before the Lord under Eli. And in those days, the Word of the Lord was rare there were not many visions. One night, Eli, whose eyes were becoming so weak that he could barely see, was lying down in his usual place. The lamp of God had not yet gone out, and Samuel was lying down in the temple of the Lord where the ark of God was. Then the Lord called Samuel. Samuel answered, Here I am. And he ran to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lay down. So he went and lay down. Again the Lord called, Samuel. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am, you called me. My son, Eli said, I did not call. Go back and lay down. Now, Samuel did not yet know the Lord. The word of the Lord had not yet been revealed to him. 
And the Lord called Samuel a third time. And Samuel got up and went to Eli and said, Here I am. You called me. Then Eli realized that the Lord was calling the boy. So Eli told Samuel, Go, lay down. And if he calls you, say, Speak, Lord, for your servant is listening. So Samuel went and lay down in his place. The Lord came and stood there, calling as at other times, Samuel, Samuel. Then Samuel said, Speak, for your servant is listening. And the Lord said to Samuel, See, I am about to do something in Israel that will make the ears of everyone who hears of it tingle. At that time, I will carry out against Eli everything I spoke against his family from beginning to end. For I told him that I would judge his family forever because of the sin he knew about. His sons made themselves contemptible and he failed to restrain them. Therefore I swore to the house of Eli, the guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. Samuel lay down until morning and then opened the doors of the house of the Lord. He was afraid to tell Eli the vision. But Eli called him and said, Samuel, my son. Samuel answered, Here I am. What was it he said to you? Eli asked. Do not hide it from me. May God deal with you, be it ever so severely, if you hide from me anything he told you. So? Samuel told him everything, hiding nothing from him. And then Eli said, He is the Lord. Let him do what is good in his eyes. The Lord was with Samuel as he grew up, and he let none of his words fall to the ground. And all Israel from Dan to Beersheba recognized that Samuel was attested as a prophet of the Lord. The Lord continued to appear at Shiloh, and there he revealed himself to Samuel through his word. And Samuel's word came to all Israel. Now, the Israelites went out to fight against the Philistines. The Israelites camped by Ebenezer and the Philistines at Aphek. And the Philistines deployed their forces to meet Israel. And as the battle spread, Israel was defeated by the Philistines who killed about 4,000 of them on the battlefield. Now, when the soldiers returned to camp, the elders of Israel asked, why did the Lord bring defeat upon us today before the Philistines? Let us bring the ark of the Lord's covenant from Shiloh so that it may go with us and save us from the hand of our enemies. So the people sent men to Shiloh and they brought back the ark of the covenant of the Lord Almighty who is enthroned between the cherubim. And Eli's two sons, Hophni and Phinehas were there with the Ark of the Covenant of God. And when the Ark of the Lord's Covenant came into the camp, all Israel raised such a great shout that the ground shook. Hearing the uproar, the Philistines asked, what's all this shouting in the Hebrew camp? When they learned that the Ark of the Lord had come into the camp, the Philistines were afraid. God has come into the camp, they said. We're in trouble. Nothing like this has happened before. Woe to us! Who will deliver us from the hand of these mighty gods? These are the gods who struck the Egyptians with all kinds of plagues in the desert. Be strong, Philistines. Be men, or you'll be subject to the Hebrews as they have been to you. Be men and fight. So the Philistines fought. And the Israelites were defeated. And every man fled to his tent. The slaughter was very great. Israel lost 30,000 foot soldiers. The ark of God was captured. And Eli, two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, died. That same day, a Benjamite ran from the battle line and went to Shiloh, his clothes torn and dust on his head. When he arrived, there was Eli sitting on his chair by the side of the road watching because his heart feared for the ark of the Lord. When the man entered the town and told what had happened, the whole town sent up a cry. Eli heard the outcry and asked, what is the meaning of this uproar? 
man hurried over to Eli, who was 98 years old, and whose eyes were set so that he could not see. He told Eli, I have just come from the battle line. I fled from it this very day. Eli asked, What happened, my son? The man who brought the news replied, Israel fled before the Philistines, and the army has suffered heavy losses. Also, your two sons, Hophni and Phinehas, are dead, and the ark of God has been captured. When he mentioned the ark of God, Eli fell backward off his chair by the side of the gate. His neck was broken, and he died, for he was an old man and heavy. He had led Israel forty years. His daughter-in-law, the wife of Phineas, was pregnant and near the time of delivery. When she heard the news that the ark of God had been captured and that her father-in-law and her husband were dead, she went into labor and gave birth, but was overcome by her labor pains. As she was dying, the women attended her, saying, Don't despair. You have given birth to a son. But she did not respond or pay attention. She named the boy Ichabod, saying, the glory has departed from Israel because of the capture of the ark of God and the deaths of her father-in-law and her husband. She said, the glory has departed from Israel for the ark of God has been captured. Well, that's an up story. Wow, there is so much going on in these two chapters. first thing I want to look at is this call of Samuel. This transfer of power. God is presenting Himself to this young man who will become a leader in Israel. Spoiler! Sorry. <laughs> you figure if he's in the Bible and has his own book, he winds up as a leader. So, probably not that big a spoiler. But God is calling this young man into righteousness who has lived in righteousness as these unrighteous leaders are being removed. Now, there's a time delay between chapters 3 and 4, and I want to bring that out here in just a moment. But as we look at the call of Samuel, I want you to stop and realize this young man was given over to God without his consent. Mom prayed, God answered, Mom provided Eli with a young weaned baby who's grown up in the temple. She's come back and nurtured him, cared for him, loved on him, watched him from a distance, but Samuel never had a choice. But Samuel chose to be obedient and to be faithful. Samuel could have run away. Samuel said, I was abandoned by my mother and I'm out of here. Samuel could have come up with all of the excuses he wanted to to justify, I don't need to be here. I need to go and find myself. But instead, he remains faithfully obedient in the temple. He serves God. He follows what Eli is trying to tell him about being a good minister. And now suddenly as we get to chapter 3, this young man, and we're not given an age, we don't know how old he is at this point, but he starts getting a phone call from God. Can you hear me now? Well, we open up the chapter with, God wasn't talking to people that much. So the boy doesn't know anything about this, and he goes running to Eli, and it had been so long since Eli had heard from God, other than the prophecy that, he wasn't listening. Then he doesn't recognize it for the first couple of times. But, but he does finally recognize. And Samuel is now called not just to be a Levite, which he already was, which meant he could serve in the temple, but that he's now being called as a prophet. I'm going to do something in Israel that's going to make everybody get goosebumps on top of their goosebumps. That's the modern translation of make their ears tingle. You know, you, those things that you hear and that little cold streak goes up the back of your back. Woo! Do it again. 
I'm about to do something in Israel that is going to make the entire nation go, who? And you're going to be the one to describe it. He's already sent the prophet that some years before had spoken God's judgment against Eli, Hophni, and Phinehas. But now Samuel is getting the opportunity to confirm the prophecy. How would you like your first prophecy to be that God's going to kill your boss and you're taking over? I mean, this poor kid. This poor kid is like, um, okay. I love the fact that it says that he goes and lays down until morning and then he opens the doors. You notice it never said he went back to sleep. This boy is laying there going, okay, now what? I mean, God just showed up. And I want you to hear that. Before, it was just the voice of God. Samuel, he goes, runs off wherever Eli was sleeping. We don't know. But probably out towards the front of the front of the tabernacle so that somebody would have to step over him to get in and it would wake him up. That was pretty much the thing. You have somebody that was out at the gate to keep watch over the temple at night. So it was probably out there. And so Eli goes running out and or Samuel goes running out and he's like, I didn't call you. Go back to bed. So he goes back to bed. I didn't call you. It was the voice of God. But check out what that next verse says. And then God stood there. Don't forget that Samuel is sleeping in the holy place. He is one curtain away from the Ark of the Covenant. He is almost in the Holy of Holies. And God shows up at the curtain. Hey, Samuel. Samuel. And Samuel has this conversation with God that he is going to become a prophet, a mouthpiece for God. God will speak to him and he will speak to the people. A common word that was used of prophets was a seer. Why? Because as you'll learn from Joel when we get there, I will make your old men dream dreams and your young men see visions. Well, what are you doing in a dream? Seeing. What are you doing with a vision? Seeing. So prophets were shown things beforehand that then they would articulate with their mouth. So they got to see what God was revealing and then they got to tell the story. Sounds kind of like John with the final book of the Bible. Revelation. God lets him see and then he gives word of what's coming. I think this is fantastic when you look metaphorically, theologically, in verse cha- in chapter 3, verse 2, and in chapter 4, verse 15, Eli is referred to as no longer being able to see. And here Samuel is being called as a seer. Old Eli, who has become crusted by the world and fallen away from his first love and no longer following God the way God called him to follow him, is losing his ability to see. He can no longer recognize all of the things God's doing in his life. He doesn't look out the window and see the birds and think, what a wonderful God we serve. He he's, hears the bird and goes, shut up, I'm still trying to sleep. So we have this picture of this old man who can no longer see and this young man who is having his eyes open to what God would show him. I also want to st- stick your attention there with chapter 3 and verse 2. Because here's where our time gap comes in. We don't know how long it was between chapter 2 and chapter 3. And we don't know how long it was between chapter 3 and chapter 4. We've got a bunch of different stories that took place on a timeline that we don't have. But we do know this. In chapter 3 and verse 2, his eyes were such that he could hardly see. And by the time we get to chapter 4 and verse 15, his eyes were set and he could no longer see. So the glaucoma took that long. The cataract wasn't quite there. That's the reality. The man's 98 years old. But we don't know how long it had been since that first prophecy. 
Second thing I'd like to pull out, or third thing really, about Samuel is that now he's blessed by God. I don't know if you caught as I was reading through there all of the times that God has blessed this young man. In chapter 2, verse 26, which was last week, not this week, we were told that he grew in stature and in favor with the Lord and with men. In chapter 3 and verse 19, we're told that none of his words fell to the ground. In other words, if Samuel said it, God did it. If Samuel said it, it was direct from God and God allowed his word to do exactly what God intended it to do. His words did not fall to the ground. In chapter 3 and verse 20, he was attested among all Israel. That's why I started the way I did. Israel doesn't have a unified government. Israel isn't a unified. There are 12 tribes in the same land mass and each one is doing their own thing. But Lottie Dottie, everybody recognizes Samuel as a prophet. All of Israel, every tribe went, <laughs> you want a man of God, go see Samuel. He's up at Shiloh. He's attested. And probably my favorite is, is that transition between chapter 3 and chapter 4. From chapter 3, verse 21 into chapter 4, verse 1. Catch what's going on here, guys. We started chapter 3 with God wasn't talking to the people very often. And we get to chapter 3, verse 21, and chapter 4, verse 1, and we're told that God continuously revealed Himself at Shiloh to Samuel, and then Samuel relayed that message to God's people. We went from a time where when people were trying to get God, they got a busy signal, to a time when a phone would not quit ringing. God went from, mm-mm, why should I answer? I mean, you stop and think about that for a second, and you're like, well, wait a minute. Why wouldn't God answer? Why wouldn't God? Because nobody was calling. It wasn't that God had stepped away and said, you're not worthy. It's that the people weren't worthy. And when people aren't worthy, they don't call out to God. All you have to do to be worthy of God is call Him. That's it. All He wants us to do is go, hey, I messed that up again. Yeah, I know, I was watching. Can you fix it? Yep. That's it. I want to look at Eli for a moment. A character study of Eli, if you will. Because I think there's a lesson in there for us. His sons betray their calling and he does nothing. You talk about nepotism. Here is this dad running the temple. He's got two boys that aren't doing it right and instead of bringing them to task, he just goes, eh, boys will be boys. He does nothing and so becomes an accomplice with them. And yet, when Samuel hears a calling, Eli is able to lead him into righteousness. Go talk to him. Go tell him your servant is listening. Go tell him I'm here. Your servant is listening. Eli, who doesn't know how to do the right thing with his sons, demonstrates that he does know how to do the right thing with Samuel. He receives a prophecy against his sons and his heirs, and we have no recorded response. We have no idea how he took that news back in chapter 2. It doesn't say anything about how Eli responded to that man of God. But here we get this response. You know, that prophecy, I want you to stop and think about this. You go to your knees in prayer for your daily devotions and God answers you with, both of your sons are going to die on the same day, all of your heirs are going to be displaced and forced to beg for food and employment, and your family will have no old man, everybody's going to die in their prime. You think you might have said something back? You think you might have had some response? 
But now we get to chapter 3 and verse 14. And Samuel has confirmed what how many days, months, years previous had been prophesied. Samuel now confirms that and says something absolutely unreal. Go back and look at that verse again. The guilt of Eli's house will never be atoned for by sacrifice or offering. That is shocking. But let me put it in perspective. These men were violating the sacrifice and the offering. When you violate the very process of atonement, what is there left to atone with? They broke it for themselves. They had so disregarded God's ability to save. They had so made a mockery out of His grace and love and were using that to fatten themselves and abuse their neighbors. God said, there's no other sacrifice that can fix what you broke because you broke the sacrifice. And finally, we get a response out of Eli. In verse 18 of chapter 3, he simply says, He is Lord. Let Him do what is good in His eyes. I hear, I don't know if you do, but I hear an echo from Job. The Lord gives. The Lord takes away. Blessed be the name of the Lord. Except you'll notice there's no blessing. He simply says, He is God. Let Him do what He needs to. Now, as I read that, I have to tell you that part of my theatrical training when I was back in the day interested in theater is to read a passage with a broad breadth of emotional responses. How would a character say this line? in some resolute Shakespearean manner. Or angry and mad! Or weeping and upset! I mean, you can put all of these voices on this line. By the way, side note, this is why I hate texting. I have no idea what your emotion was behind whatever your little thumbs clicked. So I'm looking at that going, cool. Or was it cool? Or cool! Fine! It's like you look over at your beloved spouse when you've said the wrong thing and you go, you okay over there? Whatever. Mm, We are not fine. You know, there's a whole big difference between, oh, I'm fine and fine. (laughs) So how do we read this? How do we see Eli's response to this? Is he out of touch? Is he simply too old to care or to understand? Is it one of those things of, you know, you're reading along in a story and you know nobody's listening and so you throw in something absolutely chaotic just to see if they answer? And God's like, hey, I'm going to do this. Yeah, okay. Thank you, dear. Was he, was he not listening? Yeah, yeah, God's going to do His thing. Was he completely self-focused? Wait, you're going to kill my sons, but not me? Stinks to be them. Or was he completely overwhelmed? I mean, what do you say when you get that kind of word from God? Does he just fall back to the patter of his pastoral verbiage? Or had Eli repented and was now reticent in his peace with his God? Had he, between chapter 2 and chapter 3, had some time with God? I don't know. 
The Bible doesn't say. I just wanted to walk through that this morning to remind each of us that we should be careful to humbly seek an understanding of God's Word and be exceptionally slow to judge or stereotype the people that we see in there or the people that we see in the pew next to us. We need to be grace-filled. Because honestly, I, I'll speak for myself, I, I can't imagine what Eli was feeling. I cannot imagine having the God that I serve every single opportunity coming to me and saying, nope, you missed it. And I'm going to take out your boys because they sinned and you did nothing as their leader. I cannot imagine. Let me just say that God knew exactly what Eli meant then and exactly what your heart is today. And God is the judge. So let's be careful to not judge our neighbor. I want to kind of sum this up this morning. We've looked at Samuel. We've looked at Eli. Now I want to look at the ark. And I want to tell you five stories. You can just write these down. You don't have to go with me. You can look them up later. Uh, but Numbers chapter 10, verses 33 through 36. Numbers chapter 10, verses 33 through 36. Share with us when the people of Israel start to leave Mount Sinai with all of their newly built tabernacle and Ark of the Covenant. They're still under the leadership of Moses. They're still moving their way from Egypt into the Promised Land. And we're told that they set out from the mountain of the Lord, that would be Sinai, and traveled for three days. The Ark of the Covenant of the Lord went before them during these three days to find a place to rest. And the cloud of the Lord was over them by day when they set out from the camp. And whenever the ark set out, Moses said, Rise up, Lord! May your enemies be scattered! May your foes flee before you! Whenever it came to rest, he said, Return, Lord, to the countless thousands of Israel. So this is the high priest making this blessing as they go out, making this blessing as they come back. Well, he wasn't the high priest, he was the leader. Aaron was the high priest. But Moses is giving this blessing every time the Ark of the Covenant moves. We see you moving, God! Welcome back, God! Every time the Ark of the Covenant moves. Why? Because the Ark of the Covenant is the footstool of God. It is the bema seat of God. It is the throne of God. And so when the Ark moves, it's because God has moved. Except that that's the backwards understanding. You see, when God moved, the ark went with Him. That's the way it was supposed to be. And Moses was trying to teach the people that when the ark moves, it's because God is moving. And so we move the ark to be with God so we the people will follow the ark and stay in step with what God is doing. We turn to Numbers chapter 14. Verses 39 through 45. Numbers 14, 39 through 45. And this is right after the people of Israel have been rejected because they refused to go into the promised land. They had the spies sent out, and the spies came back with a bad report, and they were like, oh no, we could never do it. We'll just stay here in camp. And God was like, really? Fine, you're right. Y'all don't get to go in. I'm going to let you walk around in the desert for 38 years till you're all dead, and then I'll bring your kids in. I'm still going to fulfill my promise. You're just not going to see it. Your kids will see it. And that's what's going on here in Numbers 14. And Moses reports all of this to the Israelites, and they mourned bitterly. Early the next morning, they set out for the highest point in the hill country, saying, now we're ready to go up into the land the Lord promised. That ship sailed yesterday, dork boy. Do you trust God? No! Fine, we'll wait till your kids do. Wait, wait, wait. I can trust Him. <laughs> now we're ready to go up to the land the Lord promised. Surely we have sinned. Moses said, why are you disobeying the Lord's command? This will not succeed. 
Do not go up because the Lord is not with you. You will be defeated by your enemies for the Amalekites and the Canaanites will face you there. Because you've turned away from the Lord, He will not be with you and you will fall by the sword. Nevertheless, in their presumption, they went up toward the highest point in the hill country, though neither Moses nor the Ark of the Lord's Covenant moved from the camp. Then the Amalekites and the Canaanites who lived in that country came down and attacked them and beat them down all the way to Hormah. God said, don't go. They went anyway. They got smacked. But God didn't move. That's why they got smacked. Joshua chapter 3, verses 1 through 4. In Joshua 3, 1 through 4, this is where the kids finally get to move into the promised land. And they're approaching the Jordan River, and they're about to cross the Jordan River in chapter 3 in the following verses. And early in the morning, Joshua and all the Israelites set out from Shittim and went down to the Jordan where they camped before crossing over. And after three days, the officers went through the camp giving orders to the people. When you see the Ark of the Covenant of the Lord your God and the Levitical priests carrying it, you are to move out from your positions and follow it. Then you will know which way to go since you've never been this way before. But keep a distance of about 2,000 cubits between you and the ark. Do not go near it. So stay back so everybody can see the box. And where the box goes, you go. Because you're the first time in here. And God made the place, so he's a great guide. Just follow where God leads. We jump up to Joshua chapter 6, verses 1 through 9. And by Joshua chapter 6, we're now dealing with the city of Jericho. And the people have crossed, and they've come up the mountain, and they're getting ready to attack. And it says, now the gates of Jericho were securely barred because of the Israelites. No one went out, and no one came in. And the Lord said to Joshua, see, I have delivered Jericho into your hands, along with its king and its fighting men. March around the city once with all the armed men. Do this for six days. Have seven priests carry trumpets of ram's horns in front of the ark. And on the seventh day, march around the city seven times with the priests blowing the trumpets. When you hear them sound a long blast on the trumpets, have the whole army give a loud shout. Then the wall of the city will collapse and the army will go up, everyone straight in. So Joshua, son of Nun, called the priests and said to them, Take up the ark of the covenant of the Lord and have seven priests carry trumpets in front of it. And he ordered the army, advance, march around the city with an armed guard going ahead of the ark of the Lord. When Joshua had spoken to the people, the seven priests carrying the seven trumpets before the Lord went forward, blowing their trumpets, and the ark of the Lord's covenant followed them. The armed guard marched ahead of the priests who blew the trumpets, and the rear guard followed the ark. At this time, the trumpets were sounding. So, who's walking around Jericho? God, with His people right behind. They're following God. Now we jump all the way up to Judges chapter 20. Judges chapter 20, verses 27 through 28. Judges 20, 27 through 28. And, and here's the point I want to make with this. There are only 21 chapters in Judges, which means we're only two pages from Samuel. This is just before the time of Samuel. Okay, when we get to Judges chapter 20. And the Israelites inquired of the Lord because they were in the midst of a civil war with Benjamin and they weren't sure if they should go up, if all the tribes should go up against the tribe of Benjamin or not. It's a horrid story. If you, if you just are having one of those, you're in the mood for a horror movie, go back and read the story of the Levite in the land of Benjamin who has his concubine raped to death and then he takes her and cuts her up into 12 pieces and sends it to all the nations to say, hey, are we going to let this city away with it? It's a nasty story. But the Israelites are curious, okay, do we keep smacking down the Benjamites? Do we keep going to war with the Benjamites? Because every time they went up against the Benjamites, they lost. So it's like, wait, they sin, we come up to spank them, and we get beat. Ah. So the Israelites inquired of the Lord. Parenthetically, is what we were after. In those days, the Ark of the Covenant of God was there with Phinehas, son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before it. 
So this is before the 40 years of Eli, but just barely. Now we have Phineas, the son of Eleazar, the son of Aaron, ministering before the ark. And they ask, shall we go up to fight against the Benjamites, our fellow Israelites, or not? And the Lord responded, go, for tomorrow I will give them into your hands. So just a few years earlier, probably 50 years, 60 years, this story takes place where God was still answering because they were still inquiring. But how did they inquire of the Lord? They went to the ark. I'm saying all this simply to help you to understand that what has happened by the time we get to the time of the judges is that God has become tied in the minds of the people to this box. This ark. If you want God to do something, move the box. Because where the box goes, God goes. No, where God goes, the box is supposed to go. But the people had gotten it backwards. So, okay, the Ten Commandments said that they couldn't make an image for God, but we sure have His box. I mean, we don't have an idol of God, but we've got His ark. So we can come, I mean... We're sprinkling blood out of it. Isn't that kind of worshiping the box? Isn't that... Kind of, huh? You're starting to see why it's so important to understand Leviticus. Because then you can start to see how wrong these folks were. So, if I can get a hold of the ark, I can say, hey God, we're going to go over here. And I got God with me because I brought the box. I don't want to make this a mockery. I want you to see the way they were thinking. Because the way they were thinking is, if I can get an angle and a leverage on God, then I can make God do what I want Him to. I see a lot of parallels between that and the way some of our higher churches treat the saints and Mary. If I can just get Mary's attention to talk to God for me, He'll do what I want Him to. If I can get Jesus' mommy to get Him by the ear and make Him behave, He'll do what I want Him to. It was the exact same thing that these people were doing. Grab the box and move it. I'm going to make God do what I want God to. To do So here what's going on in this story is the people of Israel are trying to force God to be on their side. You look back at the story and they said, why is it that we're losing? Why is it that we're not winning this battle? But they don't ask God. They ask each other. Instead of going up to the ark and crying out to the Lord like they did in Judges 20, just a few years earlier, instead of coming up and saying, hey, what are we doing wrong? They come up and say, hey, you're coming with us. <laughs> Excuse me. Similar to so many times in history where people have tried to force God to be on their side. One of my favorite classes that I took when I was in my undergraduate was a class on Christianity's development from the pilgrims to the promise keepers. It was a fantastic look at how things... And my favorite section was looking at all of the different sermons from the preachers in the north and in the south during the Civil War. Because God is on our side. And how they were twisting this to say, I've got the ark. I'm going to make God be on my side. I'm going to do what God... Can you guys feel my passion about this? Um, we are not to grab God by the ear to try to make Him behave. And it's why I have stood in this pulpit and made so many comments over the last couple of years about the religious politics of our day. When so many individuals are tying their particular political opinion 
to God as though God was on their side instead of seeking God to see what He would have us to do. I see this exact same thing happening again. We're just grabbing the ark and trying to force God to do what we want Him to do because we want our nation to go our way. So God, in His wisdom, separates the ark from His people. He says, fine, we're going to let the Philistines play with the box for a little while. What's going on? He's calling Samuel. He's placing Samuel. He's continually speaking through Samuel. So what he does is effectively says, fine, you guys are worshiping the box. Let's get rid of the box for a minute. And can you hear me now? Because now I'm talking through Samuel. I'm dealing with what's going on. I'm talking to you directly from my tabernacle. Are you listening? It's not about the box. The box is over there. I'm still here. I'm still ministering to you. There's no power in the symbol. There's only power in the relationship. I'll come back to that. I want to bring out a couple of quick notes. I want you to notice that no comment is given for the deaths of Hophni, Phinehas, or Eli. As we end chapter 4, everybody is talking about the ark. The ark is lost. Not, oh my goodness, the whole priesthood just got decimated. It's that we've lost the ark. We've lost that symbol of God amongst us. Eli falls to his death not because of his sons, but because of the ark. He doesn't flip over backwards and break his neck when they said, yeah, Hophni and Phinehas are dead. He was like, phew. I mean, that must have been a relief. I mean, as horror as that may sound, for how many months and years had he been waiting for that other shoe to fall? God had already told him what was going to happen. Is it today, Lord? Is it today, Lord? Is it today, Lord? Is it today, Lord? He doesn't react when Hophni and Phinehas are killed because he'd already been preparing himself for that reality. He falls because of the loss of the ark. He was watching because he was worried for the ark. He wasn't worried for his sons. He knew their fate. In verse 15 of chapter 3, we're told he's 98. In verse 18, we're told he's overweight because he was heavy. That's that's really clean language for saying he was an old man, he was fat. Oh, does that not resonate when the accusation against him was since the boys were taking the fatted portion of the offering and eating it for themselves, Eli was getting fat off it too. There's, don't miss what's going on in that language. Don't miss what's being hinted at. But we're also told that he led the nation of Israel as their priest for 40 years. I also want to take some note of the lineage here because we're told that we have Eli gives birth to Phinehas, gives birth to Ichabod. Ichabod's going to show up in a couple more chapters. We'll see him again. Um, By the way, Ichabod. How many of you guys went to, you know, Ichabod Crane? It's the only person we know that's named Ichabod, you know. Um, in Hebrew, kavod is the name is the word for glory. So, e kavod is without glory. So, li- literally, she named this boy no glory. We're, we're without glory, and that's explained in here because the glory had departed from Israel. I had one more thought before I started my conclusion, and that is, who's going to raise the boy? Ichabod's dad was killed in battle. Ichabod's mom goes into labor and dies giving labor, giving birth to him. Who, who raises Ichabod? The little things that I think about when I'm reading. Anyway. Obviously, I've entitled this morning's talk The Power Transfer. A transfer from the ungodly 
to the godly. In verse 1 of chapter 3, the Word of God was rare, and by the time we get to 321, the Word of God is continuous out of Shiloh. But that one's obvious. I want to talk to you this morning about the transfer of power and authority from God into trinkets. The transfer of power of God into articles. You see, because I don't want to miss what's going on here between the Israelites and this ark. They had begun to worship the box instead of the God whose throne that box served. The ark of God was treated like an amulet. And so my question to you, my question to me, is do we treat God like a good luck charm? Have we reduced the living God to an inanimate thing that we can manipulate? Have we transferred the power of God to inanimate things, to ideas, to principles. I always get cracked up when I get my doors blown off by somebody that's got a Christian bumper sticker or an ichthus or a cross on their car. I always get humored hearing conversations and coarse language and off-color jokes out of somebody wearing a shirt from Caruso. You got your Christian symbols, but do you have Christ? You got your God image, but do you have God? You got your ichthus, your little fish design? You got your what would Jesus do bracelet? You got your cross on a chain around your neck? You would not believe how many absolute heathen soldiers I dealt with over the years that were wearing a cross on an Necklace, because their mom had given it to them. They wouldn't know Jesus if He was standing in the same barracks. Do we? Have we in our sophistication, have we in our distance from these, oh, I cannot believe how dense they were. Israelites, please note the sarcasm. Do we do the same thing with our bumper stickers? Do we do the same thing with this book? This is the Word of God revealed to us that we might find Him, but it is not God. There's folks I know that worship this book. They can tell you everything that's in it, but they couldn't tell you the guy that's behind it. Do we worship God? Or His images? Or His trappings? Have we replaced God with the church? Oh, I belong to that church. Yeah, but do you belong to God? Well, I'm at church every Sunday. Yeah, but do you belong to God? I serve on the board. I sing in the choir. I do all the right things. I have communion. I was baptized. I do all of these fun things. But do you know God? Or are you just worshiping the trappings of religion? You see, because... The reality is all of those things are good, but they're not good enough. Those things are good because they're a response to my relationship with God. I see that ichthus and it reminds me to not drive like a heathen. Because I know I've got that dumb thing on my car. And I have to be a witness to the world. So I have to take my foot out of the accelerator. Because I like to drive fast too. But, if I'm going to have that cross around my neck, shouldn't the, those words come out of my mouth? Shouldn't those actions come out of my life? I mean, if I have a relationship with God, it ought to show up. But I think what we've done, and we've got to be careful in our society, we've got to be careful as us, a congregation, to say, wait a minute, am I worshiping God through these trinkets or am I just wearing the trinkets because it gets me associated with God? 
these people were using the Ark of the Covenant as a trinket. They were using it like we use bumper stickers and bracelets. If that comes out of a relationship with God, then it is good and holy and right. If it is a tool that you use to connect with people so that you can witness the relationship you already have, then you are in a good place. I am not against bracelets and bumper stickers and crosses. What I am against is losing sight of the relationship we are supposed to have with God and replacing Him with a trinket. Because if we make that power transfer we are truly powerless. What Rudy was saying this morning is absolutely true. If the Holy Spirit lives within us and moves within us and draws us into righteousness, then I don't need a cross on my shirt to convince you that I'm a Christian. It will be in my actions and my words. It will be in the way that I live my life. Don't, for the love of God, don't transfer your thought from God to a trinket and think that the trinket is good enough. Keep the first love. Serve God. Seek first His kingdom. And all these things will be added to you. Heavenly Father, as I close out this morning's message, I ask that You would speak to the hearts of each and every individual here, me first, that You would convict us where we are out of step with You, that we might repent. For unlike Eli, You have not spoken a word against us that says no atonement or sacrifice will cleanse. You have, in fact, sent Your only begotten Son as an atonement to cleanse our sins And that is more than enough. There is nothing that we can do so bad that the goodness and righteousness of Christ cannot cover through His love and through His death on the cross. I ask, Lord God, that You would return us to our first love. That we would not mistake the healing for the healer. That we would not mistake the gift for the giver. That we would not forget that behind that salvation is a Savior. Keep us, Lord God, in step with You that we may seek Your face not to manipulate or leverage You, but that You might shape and transform us into Your image to create in us a clean heart and a right life. Speak to each of us now, Lord God. Deal with our infirmities and our sins, our failures and our weaknesses. Heal us, restore us, and draw us to You. Through Christ our Lord. Amen. Well, you've come. You've worshipped. Now go and serve. Amen.